You're all very welcome to today's webinar. Um, my name is Una Caffrey, I'm the coordinator of Fingal Sipsi. Today is the final webinar in our series, Anxiety Time to Change the Lens. And our focus will be on uh, those who've experiences, experienced adverse childhood experiences. Um, so our speaker as usual is Mark Smith, um, and we have Claire from Jigsaw, um, who will be moderating the questions. Hi, Claire. Um, so there is a chat function on the side. You can put your questions in there and we'll take questions at the end. We'll be finished at two. Um, so uh, enjoy. And um, as I said, the speaker today is Mark Smith. Mark's a clinical psychologist with CAMS and also the 2020 president of the Psychological Society of Ireland. And I'm sure Mark will introduce himself. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming along to the, as you said, the, the last in our series of webinars about anxiety in, in young people. Today, we're going to take a slightly different angle than we have before, and we're going to look at ACEs and anxiety. So ACEs are adverse childhood experiences, and within that, we're also going to talk a little bit about trauma and about the impact that, that this can have. So as Una mentioned, I'm a, a clinical psychologist, and this was a lot of my interest in ACEs has come from working in a high support unit for children in care for, for almost 10 years. And sadly, many of these young people experienced multiple ACEs that led them on a journey to end up living in, in care with ourselves. So rather than getting straight into a kind of clinical description of what ACEs are, what I wanted to do was to share with you a story of a young girl called Mary. And Mary is an amalgamation of a number of different stories of young people that I've worked with over the years. And what I want you to do is, as we go through the story is to just imagine what it might be like to be a child and to have this inner experience of living through these events. And this is where, again, we're, we're talking about anxiety and, and this is just a, a glimpse into their world. But to, to ask yourself the question at the end of this, would I feel anxious if I'd been through these experiences? This is at times a difficult story to hear, but I suppose for, for us as as adults working with these young people, if we can't hear and listen to and, and validate and understand the stories that these young people experience, then what would it be like for them not to, to feel heard, to feel validated? So this is Mary's story. Oh, here we go again, being moved to another placement. Great, just what I need. Another family, more new people to meet, where they expect me to fit in, to talk to, to trust. I've never even met them before. Why should I trust them? Why would they want me living with them anyway? My own family don't want me, so why would complete strangers want me? It's just a job to them. They don't really care about me because how could they? They're just getting paid to look after me. I'm just another kid coming through the door and won't last, never does. No one can look after me. I've had to look after myself all my life. I've survived this far, haven't I? I just need myself because it's the only person I can trust in this world. They don't get me. They haven't lived my life. I've had to move 15 times and I'm still only 15 years old. The last place didn't work out, as usual. They expect me to sit at the table and eat with them and their family. It was just too weird. My mother never cared where we had dinner. We could have had it on the roof for all she cared. And that's if there was any food to eat in the first place. She was usually too depressed and too hungover to give a damn what we did. I was the oldest, so I had to make sure my brothers and sisters got some sort of food into them. It didn't matter what they ate, where they ate, or what time of day or night, once they got some food into them. Bedtimes, what a joke. We never really had any. We did what we wanted, when we wanted, and most of the time we set up as long as we wanted, and we were in charge. We had the power, and we loved it, or at least we thought we did at the time. Anything we wanted to watch on TV, any game we wanted to play, no one really cared. We were believed we were invincible and we didn't have to listen to adults. It didn't work out so well in school though. Then sometimes she would care. Or at least that's what she told us the reason was for hitting us. We were too noisy, too dirty, didn't what we were told. She was tired, sick. She wished we were never born, wished we'd just go away and leave her alone. There were always so many reasons for why she would beat us or one of her boyfriends would. There were so many of them coming in and out of our lives, thinking they could tell us what to do. We didn't know them and they meant nothing to us. And who did the hell they think they were telling us what to do? If they hit us, she just stood by and let them and told us we deserved it and if we weren't so bad, it wouldn't have happened. I took more abuse than the younger ones. 
and admit to things I haven't done, so I'd be hit instead of them. They were too small to be hit, and I was used to it. I didn't even cry when they hit me, which seemed to make things worse. They wanted to see me cry. Keeping the bruises hidden in school became difficult because there was only so many times I could say I fell or banged into something or had a fight with my brother. So eventually I just learned to say nothing, to live in my head where people couldn't get to me. How did they expect me to have homework done, to concentrate in school or I had no lunch? I couldn't admit that because family comes first no matter how badly they treat you. I hid the hunger, the bruises, the fear, the anger because I knew if I told I'd be taken away and then who would look after the kids? I had a dad once, at least I thought he was my dad until I was seven, and he drank as well. He had a serious temper, and he'd smoke things that would make him go all funny. He wasn't perfect, but sometimes he'd act like a proper dad, and he'd play with us and tell us stories and buy sweets. Then when I was seven, he left. I don't know why. I wonder it's because we were too bold. When he drank, he'd fight with mum, and they'd scream and curse at each other, and he'd hit her and say he was going to kill her, and I'd sit at the top of the stairs and stop my brothers and sisters going down to see what was wrong. All I wanted to do was cry, but I had to be strong for the younger ones. So I bottled up. I didn't have anyone else I could talk to to see about what I was hearing and feeling, but who would listen to me? Who'd understand? If we were taken away from them, where would they put us? What would it be like? And would we get to see our parents again? Would they get new kids to replace us? Would our new families beat us too? And what would I say to the kids in school? I couldn't figure out how they felt about us. Some days mum would give us a hug and say she loved us, and five minutes later she hated us and said she only drank because of how bad her behaviour was. Getting up each morning, I never knew which mum I'd meet that day, whenever she got up. The night time wasn't much better. How can you be expected to sleep at night when you watch the slow ticking of a clock, each movement of the hand getting closer to that time when you hear the door opening, the footsteps holding your breath while you wait to discover if the shouting and fighting will start all over again? It was hard when Dad left. I felt so sad, and mum cried a lot and drank more than ever. And I got upset one night and shouted that it was her fault that Dad left, and that's when she said he wasn't really my dad. I still don't know who I belong to. I might never find out. So, so I think what some of you you might have experienced from hearing that story is the sense of psychological trauma that a young person who has been and had the life that Mary had would have gone through. And what psychological trauma is, is the unique individual experience. And the individual piece is so important that it's individual to each person that they experience that of, of one big event or also enduring conditions. And what happens is the individual's ability to integrate his or her emotional experience is just totally overwhelmed or the experiences a, a threat that to them feels like it's a threat to their life, to their bodily integrity, or to their sense of, of sanity. When we look at trauma, it, it can occur on multiple levels, so to an individual, a group, or to a community. There could be a single incident of a trauma, perhaps a traffic accident or a house fire, or something that's unexpected and very overwhelming. There can be complex trauma, which is interpersonal in relationships and enduring over many times. And we, we see that in many cases in Mary's story. It could also be developmental trauma. And we'll talk a little about this more about exposure to early life trauma and ACEs. We also unfortunately see incidents of intergenerational trauma where we have within families that trauma is passed from generation to generation. We know all too well, unfortunately, in Ireland about historical trauma, about the impact of childhood sexual abuse, about the the experiences of people who've been in residential schools. And also we have learned a lot more in recent years about the trauma that immigrants to our country, refugees, marginalized groups and ethnic minorities, and the ongoing trauma that they can often experience because of being part of those groups. So what I want to do here is just introduce you to the idea of small T's and big T's when we're looking at trauma. Sometimes we can be a little invalidating of, of small, what we perceive to be everyday traumas um, and only perceive something as being valid and overwhelming when it's a large one. So all of us will know what it feels like to experience stress. It's a typical emotion that we all experience and we can get quite anxious about it. But we also need to be able to differentiate between what is tolerable stress and what is toxic stress. <laughs> Thank you.
Learning to deal with stress is an important part of healthy development. When experiencing stress, the stress response system is activated. The body and brain go on alert. There's an adrenaline rush, increased heart rate, and an increase in stress hormone levels. When the stress is relieved after a short time, or a young child receives support from caring adults, the stress response winds down and the body quickly returns to normal. In severe situations, such as ongoing abuse and neglect, where there is no caring adult to act as a buffer against the stress, the stress response stays activated. Even when there is no apparent physical harm, the extended absence of response from adults can activate the stress response system. Constant activation of the stress response overloads developing systems with serious lifelong consequences for the child. This is known as toxic stress. Over time, this results in a stress response system set permanently on high alert. In the areas of the brain dedicated to learning and reasoning, the neural connections that comprise brain architecture are weaker and fewer in number. Science shows that the prolonged activation of stress hormones in early childhood can actually reduce neural connections in these important areas of the brain at just the time when they should be growing new ones. Toxic stress can be avoided if we ensure that the environments in which children grow and develop are nurturing, stable, and engaging. Okay, so what we're seeing there, and we're going to talk a little bit more about, is that stress and, and toxic stress is, is not just about one big stressor, but it sometimes is the, the cumulative impact. And we see that we know from before that the weight of a ton of feathers and a ton of stone is the same, so that we need to be mindful of, of the cumulative impact of all of these stressors on our young people. So again, we want to look a little bit more specifically about trauma in the brain. And we've learned an awful lot more over the last couple of years about how trauma has a, a direct physiological impact on the brain. Um, some of you may be familiar with the work of Vessel van der Boek, and he's wrote a, a really seminal book about the body keeps the score. And this is what some of it is, is that the traumas that we experience, our body remembers the impact of those traumas. So there are a number of parts of the brain that are impacted. So if we look at the amygdala, that controls instinctive responses or instinctive ability to keep ourselves safe. It looks at fear, it looks at memory, and it looks at emotion. We also have the limbic system, which is the emotional part of our brain. And that's a perception and a reaction to threat and threat levels. And as if we look, if we think back of the story of Mary, Mary's limbic system more than likely would have been, been active and ready to protect her and her siblings at all times because the experience in the environment that she was living in was entirely predictably unpredictable. So she needed to be ready to be responsive to that threat. She needed to be in a constant fear state because she couldn't anticipate whether she would be cared for or whether she would be hurt. We also look at the prefrontal cortex, so that's the thinking part of our brain. And many young people who, are, and anyone really who struggles with anxiety, one of the things they will most commonly talk about is that they overthink everything. And that's a, that's a fear response. I need to keep thinking because if I don't, how will I anticipate danger? Especially for young people who've experienced trauma or ACEs, their life experience is that the, on a day-to-day -day basis, danger is going to come before me. So I need to th think constantly to anticipate where this might come from because I need to find this threat to be able to keep myself safe. What that does is it analyzes problems and it learns some experiences. So I've learned before that if I get close, I have the potential to get hurt. So I need to be careful. Can I trust this person? How can I keep myself safe? How can I predict if this person is trustworthy or not? So in, in normal circumstances, when we encounter a difficult or anxiety provoking event, one of the, the three responses we would typically have is to fight, to run away from that situation or to freeze. And each one of those are protective responses. And what we try to do afterwards is to, to fix that particular threat or, or, or situation that we're in. But for, for a young person who experiences significant and ongoing trauma and ACEs, their ability to influence their environment to fix that threat around them is extremely limited. So it leaves the young person in a very 
difficult place where they don't feel that they can control the threat that's around them. So one of the things that happens when, we're, when we, we are overly stressed and we encounter toxic stress and ACEs is that we get an increase in adrenaline. So our heart rate increases, our blood pressure and our, and our energy increases because we need to be responding to the threat that's there. So for many younger people who've experienced a lot of ACEs, they can often be described as a bit on the edge, a little bit on the go. And for many, that could be actually a protective response because they, they perceive threat all around them. It also sees an increase in cortisol and that reduces functions that are non-essential. So we reduce our non-essential functions down so that we're able to get into a situation where we can fight or run away. And again, like Mary and many children, they're stuck between these two places. Do I need to fight? Do I need to run away? Because I think there's going to be danger all around me because that has been my life experience. So what we want to do when we look at trauma is to look at how the experience of trauma can affect your, your window of tolerance. So the, the window of tolerance for most people, we would hope, is where things are just right, where we can at best cope with the challenges that are inevitable in life. Um, and you're just not alert, not anxious. You're just kind of you're, you're OK and you can manage within that, even if life throws you a curveball. But unfortunately, if we experience multiple ACEs, multiple traumas, we can experience dysregulation in, in two different ways. So the first might be where we feel a little agitated, we've been anxious, a bit angry. We're not completely out of control, but not really, really comfortable. And the more traumas, the more ACEs that we experience, we can end up in hyper arousal, where for many young people, they're extremely anxious, angry. They're pushing people away because they feel very threatened by their feelings. They feel that they become very, very overwhelmed and their instinct is constantly to fight or to run away. We also see the opposite effect, that the overwhelming nature of ACEs and trauma can be where that person feels that they're kind of shutting down a little bit. They're going into, like on your iPhone, it's going into saving the, the battery mode. Um, a little spacey or feel a little bit sluggish, but just not comfortable. And then we meet young people who, because of the experiences that they've been through, they experience hypo arousal. And that's where they're just numb, where they're just physically and emotionally shut off from their emotions. They're not able to connect with them because they feel so overwhelming. And that's the body essentially shutting down all of its connection to emotions because it just feels like it's, it's too much. It's too big to process. We're going to look at specifically adverse childhood experiences and examples of, of what they are. And there's plenty of those in Mary's story. So it could be traditionally what we might you know, consider abuse, you know, physical abuse, emotional abuse or sexual abuse. But it can also be neglect, that where our emotions are just neglected within the environment that we're in um, or we're physically neglected or basic care needs or Maslow's hierarchy are just not being met. But also the impact, I suppose, of what can go on in, in a household where we have a parent who has their own challenges with mental health, where we have a member of the family who might be incarcerated in prison or experiences domestic violence or substance abuse or a breakdown in a family relationship. And for many children, it's not about how they survive one of these, but it's how they survive, try to survive many of them. So if we look at the, the typical questions that we would look at when we consider ACEs and before your 18th birthday, did a parent or an adult in the house swear at you or insult you, push, grab, or throw something at you? Uh, engage with you in a sexual way that was completely inappropriate, that people didn't make you feel loved, that you didn't have enough to eat or clean clothes? Did you lose a parent through abandonment or divorce or, or death? Um, did you experience domestic violence? Was there a problem with substance abuse? Was there substance difficulties with mental health? Or, or some go to prison. So these are kind of the, the questions that you would, as, as a, a therapist or a person working with the young people, try to understand the experiences of this young person. What we also know from studies, uh, from large studies in the States, is that the multiple experiences of ACEs within childhood, the more ACEs that a person experiences, the more likely they are to experience very significant challenges later in life, including um, serious illness and sometimes up to death. So as you can see from this slide, the greater the likelihood of experiencing one or more of those previous ACEs massively increases the likelihood that in later life you might experience depression, anxiety, uh, significantly misuse alcohol or drugs. So we need to look at not just each of these things individually, but the cumulative impact on the, on the life of a child. 
So some of you might have seen this slide before that I've used in other talks about our, our radar for anxiety. So for, for those of us who have been lucky enough to not to experience significant ACEs, our anxiety radar for perception of threat can see three airplanes on the radar. It doesn't seem that overwhelming and challenging, but we can manage it. We don't need to get overly anxious about what's happening there. For a child who's experienced multiple ACEs, sometimes over many years of their life, or perhaps it's all they're ever known, when they look at their threat radar, it feels like that threat is everywhere because it has been for most of their life. So they need to be constantly on alert for danger and it feels very overwhelming and they can't tell whether that's an airplane, is that a bird? I just need to either shut down or, or to get really, really anxious about how to keep myself safe. So a lot of what we've talked about so far and, and the traumas and the ACEs that, that young people experience, it has a very significant effect on a child's attachment style, not just with their parent, but the attachments that they would form with their peers and with others later in life. So what we would all hope for that is a child would have a secure attachment with their primary caregivers, their primary carers. And when they experience that, that secure attachment, they learn to trust themselves and others. They have a balanced and healthy view of themselves. They can speak and, and make their needs known quite easily. They can tune into emotions, to be dependent, have relatively good self-esteem. And, and if they do get triggered by something, they can manage that response in a way that we would expect. But then we will see other attachment styles where if you've been through the experiences of Mary or others, where you can feel insecure, fear abandonment, uh, go into chronic survival mode, not trust, push people away, even though we want them close. And what you see across all of the attachment styles when they experience difficulty is high anxiety. It's because of the uncertainty, the not knowing, will my care needs be met or will I end up being hurt? So we've got a huge overlap between the experiences of trauma and ACEs and the attachment that we form with our primary caregivers and others and the influence of anxiety on those. So what we hope to do if we want to reduce children's anxiety who experience trauma and ACEs? Well, maybe we just need to bring everyone to a psychologist because, you know, trust me, I'm a psychologist and, and everyone trusts us, shouldn't they or don't they? Question that many young people have posed to me and it's a very valid question is, why should I trust you? So for them, their experience, unfortunately, had been that they couldn't trust their parents, the, the person who brought them into the world and was automatically entrusted with keeping them safe, meeting their needs emotionally and physically. And for them to come into to me, a, a complete stranger, a professional, and I deliberately don't wear suits or formal work, formal clothes in, in, in work because of that for young people being a barrier. And you're a person of authority and, and there's this implicit assumption that no matter what experience that, that they've been through, that they should just trust you. And it's because you, know, you tell them, well, you should trust me. I'm a professional psychologist and I'm going to be here to help you. And the point that I would make to most young people is that I get it. I, I get why you don't trust me and why you wouldn't, why you're anxious about trusting me. And from my point of view, one of the things that I need to do is to try and where I can to earn that trust of that young person. I think what's really important when we look at young people who have been through ACEs is that we would look at them through a compassionate lens. So you will hear in different contexts, looking at a child who's been through these experiences, they're very controlling. And when their experience has been like Mary's has, where it was chaos, it was unpredictable, where there's a complete and utter absence of control in their life, could we really blame them for wanting to find some degree of control? Because their world was unpredictable, dangerous and, and anxious. So the controlling was something that they needed to do to survive. Other young people will withdraw and we worry about them and we think that, look, we need to pull them out. We need to get them meeting with friends. Why don't you go meet your friends? Why won't you go to school? Because sometimes withdrawal was the only thing that kept them safe when they experienced multiple ACEs. So when we, when we suggest this to young people to, you know, just take a deep breath and go out and, and ask your friends to come out or go into school or join this club. We're, what we're trying to do is to ask them to overcome their primary safety mechanism. The thing for keeping quiet, staying hidden, kept me safe. So we need to be compassionate, understanding that this may not be as easy for someone who's experienced trauma and ACEs. The other thing that we can do sometimes is that we can try and overcome emotional abuse and, and them being disregarded by, by a loved one with loads of positive regard. And we tell them that they're amazing and they're fantastic and they're funny and they're, they're, they're bright and they're very skillful. And all of those things could be true. But if their own internal experience was that I'm unlovable because my parent was for whatever reason, unable to love me, 
that conflicts so much with their own inner experience of who they believe that they are and trying to overcompensate for this sense of I'm not good enough and I can't be loved with no you're great it, it just doesn't land with that young person because parent may have told them before that or care that you know you're great and in the following moment that they hate them so understandably they can be anxious about the process of trusting I think what we also need to talk about is with ACEs is that as always prevention is so much more important than cure. What we don't want is a situation where we have preventable situations that we could do something about, but that we wait till afterwards to try and support people through the trauma after it's occurred. So really, if we want to interrupt ACEs, what we have to do is to help the adults to heal. We have to support the adults in their lives to be able to process and manage their own traumas to, to, to heal the carers. What that might look like and on a very macro level is about helping parents with, with the basics of parenting, not to assume that they, they have those skills, to ensure through financial supports, through social supports, that there's a good diet available for the child, that there's support, social supports for the family unit and not just for the child themselves. But also we know that a lot of what happens within families and the reason that families experience ACEs is because they experience poverty, they experience homelessness, they experience a lack of psychological support or they have educational needs that are not being met. So we need to look at the family as a whole and what we can do to support that family if we're going to reduce anxiety and the impact of ACEs on them. On a very basic level, what, what children need who, who've experienced this, and it can be hard for them, is they want to feel safe. They want to feel like they can engage with the world, engage in relationships and not need to feel anxious that this person that they're engaging with is going to hurt them. So this very basic human need to feel safe. What we know about anxiety is anxiety is fed off of the world being an unpredictable place and nothing being consistent. So we need to sometimes, despite the young person's response, is to try and be as consistent as we can. And that can be difficult for adults because we want our own things. And my rule of thumb is that if you can be 75% consistent with a child, you're, you're doing pretty good. But it's also about making the world as, as predictable as it can. And in particular, this sense of, of predictable care that no matter what the child is going through, that they, they would push back against you. And I've seen that through working with children in care for many years is that when they start to build that relationship with you, often they would push back because this feeling of being cared for makes them anxious and they don't really know why the stranger wants to care for them. And when we look at it through that lens and when they push back and, and we might consider oh, they're being very controlling. We understand more about why this, this care that we're trying to give them feels so anxiety provoking for them. Thank you for that and happy to take any questions that might come. We don't have any questions yet, Mark. We're sure there might be some coming through. My own anxiety is increasing now. Is it that it was really, really clear and everyone got it or no one knew what I was talking about? Uh, no, it was a, people did understand what you're talking about. As a lay person coming to it, it was uh, really good information, Mark, and as usual, uh, good to hear it. Um, there's, there, I can see something in the chat function. Oh, yes, there's lots of praise there, Mark. Um, fantastic. Um, people found it really good, so you can let that anxiety go. Thank you. Um, I, I don't see any other questions. We'll give it a couple of minutes, but just for, from me, um, as, as people are taking their time, maybe to if they have questions, um, just to say thanks to everybody who attended today's webinar. We had a great attendance. Um, to Michelle, the sign language interpreter, who's working hard there in the background. Um, to Claire, who has worked on these uh, webinars over the last um, number of months and has moderated all the questions, Claire's from Jigsaw, and to yourself, Mark, for another excellent delivery. Um, we will be uh, sending it, you'll automatically receive a recording of this um, webinar uh, post-event. 
um, and then I'll be working with the tech company Click Media to put all of the webinars on one file in one folder um, and we'll have it on one website. So we'll send that out. It's a bit of work for us to do, but we'll have that done before the end of this year. Um, so, um, uh, Claire, is there anything else there that you want to come on with? There's a couple of, there's a couple of questions, yeah. Um, one of them... Oh, sorry, it scrolls by, so I might not do them in order, but I go from the, the, the most recent. So, um, does your work focus on the child or the parents to be most effective? I think that so that depends. Typical psychologist response, it depends. Uh, and a lot of it depends on the age of the child. Um, and also about the, if, if you were to work with a young person, specifically with them around their experiences of trauma and how to cope with that, but yet they're, you're, they're going home after the session with you back into the same environment. It becomes very difficult to expect that the child is going to be able to manage that. So what most of the evidence would tell us is that when we're looking at the impact of ACEs, that you have to work on supporting the family unit. And in many cases, that needs to be a, a multi-agency response. And in a lot of cases in Ireland, that would be coordinated by METHIL, who would be trying to pull in as many different supports as possible to support the young people, support the parents, with all the different pressures that are there. So I think it needs to be a response for, for the whole family. Um, I think for a young person sometimes just on their own to have a space to, to vent, to process, to cry, to be angry in a therapeutic relationship with you where you're not going to reject them. I think that can be helpful in itself and a little confusing too because you're, you're a stranger who's experiencing all of the emotions that they do and that you give a consistent and validating response so again, in the beginning, they, they can push back a little bit, but once they see that you stick with them, no matter what they throw at you, then it's similar and I've mentioned it in, in every webinar so far, you become that one good adult that, that Jigsaw has promoted so well. Um, there's a question here, how do you help a child who's very stuck in their anxiety and finds it hard to get out of it? Um, the, the first thing is always with, with every piece of anxiety is to to validate it first so before we can help someone to move where they're stuck we have to be able to recognize where they are and to say look I, I understand how anxious you are i get it it makes sense it's really really hard so before we can help anyone to move from any position they need to feel understood um if we want them to help them to get stuck if what we're trying to help them to achieve feels too big we need to break it down into as small a part as they can to be able to manage it. So when we did a webinar before, say about back to school anxiety, it might be that they would just put their school uniform on. And if that's all they can cope with, that's step one. Uh, step two might be to drive past the school and if that's what they can tolerate. So the, the more anxious they are about something, the smaller you break it down into what they can tolerate. But what we also need to remember with anxiety is that the only way that we can build confidence in managing it is being exposed to it. But we have to try as best we can get the right balance between it being small enough that they can cope with, but large enough that they experience the anxiety so that they can build confidence in managing it. Um, a question here, what is a good starting point for getting a 13 year old uh, to get help to overcome an attachment style that is fearful and avoidant? Okay, uh, that's a big one. Um, I suppose it, it's going to depend on where they're, where they're currently living, what the, what the relationship is going to be. Because in, in that setting with the young person, it's not just about them overcoming it, but it's about the relationship that they have and who they're anxious about it is. So in many cases with, with young people, I would work with both the parent and the young person so that they can know what each other's experiences are. Um, because if there's an inconsistent pattern in terms of the, the parent's availability, the young person is going to stay anxious and avoidant because they don't want to give that trust to take another chance that they might get hurt again. So it kind of depends on who the anxiety about the relationship is with. But if it's possible for both the young person and the parent to understand each other's perspectives. Um, so in some cases, it might be understandable at a point in time why a parent wasn't available. They might have had maybe a, a sibling who had a significant illness and the parent just couldn't be around and helping the young person to see that perspective, or they may have maybe struggled with their, the parent struggled with depression at some point or postnatal depression, and the child might not be aware of why they weren't available. So it's about creating a compassionate narrative for both so that both can see each other's perspectives and work on what you can do to improve the relationship because 
what you don't want to do is put the load on the young person in themselves to have to come up with the answers to improve the relationship. And that's, I suppose, why within a family therapy model, everyone in the family brings something to it and everybody has a responsibility within the relationship to see what they can do to improve it. So with attachment, it's the relationship is what the key and what everybody in that relationship can do differently. Probably um, similar uh, angles on, on different angles on a similar thing, I suppose. But um, what is the best approach to a teen who is reluctant to talk other than one word answers to questions? Um, in most scenarios, because it, it happens to me a lot, um, there's no guarantee when a young person comes into me that they're going to want to talk. Um, and I think it's important sometimes to validate that and say, look, I, I know talking is hard and it might be hard for you to trust. So address the issues about why maybe that they aren't talking. For a parent sometimes to say, look, I don't really know what's going on for you um, and you may not want to talk to me, but to me, it seems like you seem angry, you seem sad, you seem frustrated. So that we reflect back what we think might be going on. We may get it wrong. And, and to me, that's okay because what we're communicating to that young person is I'm trying to understand what's going on for you. I can see behind the one word answers. I can see behind the sullen responses and I can see emotionally that there's something going on for you that I want to try and understand. And again, even if we get it wrong, that effort of trying to emotionally connect with the young person can feel like, okay, at least someone's trying to understand me. What I would also say is that you could try and then you need to leave it with them and say, look, you seem like you're a little angry. You seem a little sad, but maybe now is the not, not the right time for you to talk. But, you know, I'm in the kitchen. If you want to come down and have a cup of tea, watch a movie, go for a drive, we don't have to talk. We can just be in one place. And that in itself can be reparative for them that you don't have an expectation. So working with a lot of those young, young people in care, they automatically came to me with a barrier that they expected me to talk. And for a lot of them, what I had to do was to take away that expectation and say, no, let's, let's go play badminton in the gym. Let's go for a cycle. I took one 14 year old for 18 holes of golf with no expectation of talking and six holes in, he started talking. The other piece around one word answers is the way that we set up the situation that we're talking to them. So a lot of people are very uncomfortable with sitting face to face. Because if we're experiencing anxiety or particularly shame, the eye contact and being looked at and, and, and maybe the perception of being judged is very difficult to overcome. So in many cases, it's much better to be side by side with the parent, with the young person. So symbolically, I'm by your side, but also I don't have to manage the eye contact piece with you. Uh, and also we're doing an activity that might mediate and then I don't have to feel intense or awkward about doing it. So... So the important thing is to just communicate that we're available if you're ready to come and talk to us. And I do that a lot with my sessions where at the end of meeting someone for the first time, I would say, we're not going to make, it, make a plan right now. And you go away and you have to think about whether you feel like you might be ready to come talk. And if you are, I'm happy to listen. And when we give young people a sense of ownership and control over when they talk or how much they talk, they're much likely to share their experiences with us. Great. I'll give Michelle a second to <laughs> have a break. She's working really hard. <laughs> um, so there's there's a question here about what if the caregiver refuses all help? That's a difficult one. Um, and I suppose depending on, on your, your role with the child, certainly if you're in a professional role, what will come into play then is children's first. And that we... If we have a concern that the relationship between the parent and the child or something that's happening between them is adversely impacting on the child's welfare, then I suppose we, we all have a duty to encourage that parent to seek help, to explain to them what's happening in the dynamic or the relationship. And if those efforts, I suppose, aren't successful, I think we do need to involve TUSA to find out, not in terms of a necessarily a child protection piece, which could occur, but two says more than just child protection. It's also about um, family support and that perhaps that parent just in that time doesn't have the resources to be able to provide the care that's needed and they need extra support to be given to them to be able to do it. But 
Well, parents often, when we might suggest to, so they get very fearful and thinking that, you know, you want to take my child away from me. And it's really important that we frame that discussion about being a support to the parent so they can support the child and clarify the difference between child protection and, and child welfare and support to the family. Thanks, Mark. Um, there's a question here about the child feel, or it's more a scenario than a question, really. The child feels like things are happening, that things are happening around them are not real. For example, the question, is this really happening? Yeah, this actually comes up quite, quite a lot, um, and particularly around when a young person feels very overwhelmed, and it's, it's an idea called derealization. And what happens in that scenario is the young person feels so overwhelmed that they, they disconnect from their current reality because their their emotions, their internal states, are they, they realize they're they're at risk of being overwhelmed. So again, using my, my kind of technology scenarios, it's kind of going into battery saver mode. I disconnect from my current reality because I don't have the confidence or the resources or the energy right now to process what's going on around me be that a, a big event or the cumulative impact of lots of events building up and then leaving me feel overwhelmed. So I disconnect from it. So again, talking to a young person and saying, look, that kind of, I can see why you might need to do that. So it's, it's all about validation. It's all about understanding and seeing that that's just the body's response to feeling overwhelmed. Thanks, Mark. I think, I think that's all the questions. There, there are a few that are essentially repeats um, asking about the preference of working with a child or a family um, but I, th I think you've answered that so the rest are just thanks to you from the questions the comments really thanks for everyone for taking up your lunch to, to come and listen thank you great um, so if that's all the questions and you finished your um, presentation I think we'll end the event um, so thanks again to everybody thanks to Mark um, for as I said for the fifth one in a row um, and um, we will be uh, circulating the recording uh, as soon as we can thanks everybody thanks <laughs>